course, dragons are the most iconic monster in the D&D world, but there is another type of creature that is almost just as ancient and well-recognized, the giants. They are massive, humanoid-like beings who dwell in remote mountains and other isolated regions. Once upon a time, they had a tremendous empire of their own, but constant wars with their eternal rivals, particularly the dragons, brought down many of their glorious constructions. Giants exist within a caste system known as the Ordning. This determines a giant's rank within the realm of giant kind, and it informs us as to the giant's role and function. From the highest position to the lowest are Storm Giant, Cloud Giant, Fire Giant, Frost Giant, Stone Giant, Hill Giant, and finally the giant kin, such as ogres, cyclopses, trolls, etc. The Ordning is a clearly defined system in that each position is absolutely superior to all that are below it. In other words, the mightiest fire giant chieftain is still inferior to an average run-of-the-mill cloud giant. Giants do compete against one another and at times even slay each other in battle. However, they seem to always stick to the Ordning. This keeps their kind from breaking down into all-out civil wars. In real-world mythology, the giant is another one of the universally present types of creatures. They are typically depicted as human-like beings of immense size and strength, and they often are enemies of mortals and of gods. Ancient Greek gives us the origin of the word giant, and Greco-Roman myths have giants and titans and their great wars with the Olympian gods. Norse giants are also quite well known, featured in ancient Norse epic poems as well as more modern sources such as Wagner's epic Ring Cycle. Even the giants from Tolkien's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are influenced by Norse mythology. There are other varieties of giants in world cultures such as Celtic, Hindu, and Japanese. The Old Testament has giant references, the Nephilim and Anakim they were called. And though these texts are often short in length, they indicate an older age in which giants dominated the land until the sons of mankind rose up as heroes and defeated them. We also find giants in fairy tales, most notably the one featured in Jack and the Beanstalk. So, as we found with the dragon, the giant is widely present throughout human culture. Something so universal, which has endured throughout the long march of cultural evolution, must certainly be connected to a deep part of the human experience. What does the archetype of the giant represent? Well, they're powerful, large, ancient, often antagonists. Perhaps as we venture through this ranking, these elements will reveal themselves more clearly to us. As usual, I'll be ranking the monsters and placing them into tiers from lowest to highest, based mainly on what is presented in the 5th edition books. I do have two very quick mentions here. The first is about the song titles that I use for the tiers. I get comments a lot about this. The songs themselves are not ranked. They're just there for flavor text for the tiers. The second mention is subscribe. I've realized that way more people watch my videos than are actually subbed to my channel. Do not idly linger by the tavern doorstep. Come in, rest beside the glowing hearth, while the bard tells tales of many a fantastical thing. Now, let us approach the mighty mountains of yore, for I hear the echoing calls of giants resounding from their primeval halls. In F tier, we begin in the muck and the mud, the boring and the basic. These couple brutes occupy a time-honored position, yes, maybe a time-dishonored position as the lowliest and most generic of giant kind. Ogres are lazy, painfully stupid, foul-tempered gluttons. They represent the worst aspects of giants. They are prominent creatures in their own regard, featuring not only in various cultural myths, but also as a common D&D monster. They can be terrifying in their own way. Yes, they're flesh-eating savages who live in primitive camps and cave dwellings. Yet in D&D, we quickly run up against their many shortcomings. Nothing but a basic attack, a generic style, limited social interactions, simplistic lore, and a near one-track behavior. Their clubs do hit pretty hard. A first or second level character will likely get knocked out with a single hit. But if we want something beyond simply my first large size monster, 
will have to keep looking. I do not hate the ogre. Do not get me wrong, and in fact, I enjoy having them in my D&D settings. But unless a DM actively builds on top of them and adds either class levels or new abilities, they're about as plain and simple as it gets. Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes gives us a few interesting ogre variants. The bolt launcher is the least interesting of them. It carries a ballista-like crossbow, but again, does nothing but basic attacks. The ballista bolts do a lot of damage for only CR2, but their accuracy is low. And that's about it. It's a basic ogre with a slightly higher AC and a low precision, high damage ranged attack. Just like that, we're done with F tier. D tier is more populous for the giants, where we're again going to encounter simplistic brutes that have limited offerings in the way of flavor and storytelling and special abilities, but we ascend these craggy foothills with our eyes set on the majestic halls of the giant lords towering from the highest peaks. Sometimes, ogres crossbreed with humanoid races and produce half-ogres. The most common of such mixes is likely ogre and orc, but half-ogres are also known to be gotten of humans, hobgoblins, and bugbears. Human mothers have very little chances of surviving the birth of a half-ogre, which does make me wonder about the so-called mating process. We've already seen how fumbly this topic was with the half-orc, and that, in my opinion, 4th edition actually had more intriguing lore. It appears that the 5th edition half-ogre doesn't even receive any hints as to this process. It's straightforward enough to imagine that ogre raids end up with some humanoid women getting brutalized, or maybe humanoid captives are forced to serve ogres' lusts, but I would have appreciated something more interesting. Perhaps there's a kind of ritualistic or barbaric rite that ogres perform in caverns lit by flaming braziers made of giant skulls. Oh well, again here it's just a basic stat block with hit points and a plain attack. Either yawn and move on, or get to working on a custom half-ogre that rides a rhinoceros mount in bone armor and delivers the strikes of the three thunders. My brave companions, we now come across the first of the true giants, the lowest ranked in the Ordning, the Hill Giant. Like the Ogre, they are mythologically relevant and iconic in their own way, but simple, awfully dim-witted, and just about as plain as plain can get. They swing great clubs and hurl rocks. They have nasty temperaments, and they want to eat, eat, eat. Their write-up in the Monster Manual leaves a great deal to be desired, as their lore takes up more than half a page, but could have been expressed in just a few sentences. We really do not need paragraph after paragraph to say that hill giants are primitive bullies who stomp around looking to feast upon whatever beasts or men they can find. Give us the legend of Jagon Og, the Hill King, whose thunderous stamps could send foes crashing to the quaking ground and pulverize them with epic-level body slams and pile drivers. Give us the grotesque glutton gorgers, who can inhale and suck targets into their gullets from 20 feet away. Give us anything other than just hit points and a basic attack. I see this over and over again with many 5th edition monsters and 3.5 edition for that matter too. So many monsters are in need of only one unique ability and a bit more story hooks in their lore. It's not asking for too much and it would make such a difference. Coming from the annals of Greek mythology is the Cyclops, a one-eyed giant of chaotic neutral alignment. They are dull of intellect and wisdom, they're primitive isolationists who react harshly to those who tread upon their territory. And once again, basic brutes with standard great club and rock attacks. Their damage potential is quite high, as most giants do have, though they have poor depth perception, which gives them disadvantage on attacks against targets more than 30 feet away. Their lore hints that they have all but abandoned the gods, Yet they are superstitious beings who are intimidated or fascinated by magic. But overall, it leaves so much in a generic state. I really wanted the Cyclops to be higher on this ranking, as the Cyclops scene from the Odyssey really affected me as a kid. But in giving this lout an objective scrutiny, he just doesn't offer enough as is. 
Take the bare bones stat blocks of the ogre or hill giant, give it proficiency with a few saving throws and athletics, immunity to cold damage, and a great axe instead of a great club, and we have the frost giant. Oh, and give it a beard too. We can't forget the massive beard. Frost giants occupy the fourth place in the ordering of the six main true giant races. They dwell in the frigid lands, loving snow fields, frosty hills, and of course, cold mountains. The Norse mythology element runs deep with the frost giants, and just looking at their artwork makes me want to queue up some Amon Amarth. Frost giants are known as cruel reavers. They march from their glacial fortresses, blowing war horns and shouting great battle cries. Their bands descend upon humanoids or whatever other people occupy the land, and they claim through might the fruits of their defenders' labor. In my home campaign, I recently ran an encounter at a frost giant lair. It had a cave mouth entrance atop a snowy mountain. Inside were massive icy tunnels and a great hall with colossal pillars. The characters faced a group composed of frost giants, winter wolves, and a roper, all led by the two-headed frost giant Ice Shamaness. It was overall a lot of fun, but I did find myself wishing that the frost giants themselves had a little something more to them. Even at low levels, I'm critical of monsters that have zero special abilities, but this issue increases at high levels, when the player characters are just bursting full of cool abilities and spells and magic items, then the monsters just have plain weapon swings. Frost Giant, you are the stuff of Viking legend, but you need to also be the stuff of interesting game mechanics. Inching into mid D tier, we find the Ogre Battering Ram. It's not much different at all from the basic Ogre, except that it has a couple abilities and a bit more evocative style. Mechanics wise, the Ogre Battering Ram deals double damage to objects and structures. Its melee bash can knock back the target, and its best ability, Block the Path, is like a variation of the 4th edition fighter's Defender class ability. It allows the Ogre to enter into a defensive stance. It functions kind of like the benefits of the dodge action, and during this time its opportunity attacks deal more damage and can stop enemies in their tracks. The Ogre Chain Brute takes us into high D tier. It has a couple of cool abilities in the way of a Chain Sweep, which is a radius attack that bludgeons and knocks enemies prone, and a Chain Smash, which is a stronger melee hit that can knock a single target unconscious. The creature is reminiscent of the Cave Troll from the Mines of Moria battle scene in the Fellowship of the Ring, which really catches my interest. It's still a simpleton ogre, but at least its abilities and aesthetic are a bit more inspiring. At the top of D tier is the Troll. They are another monster that I've always liked, and another that's reared its ugly head from the early days of my childhood by ways of fairy tales and such. We all know that trolls are savage, cruel, ugly, foul, violent, tempered, and flesh-eating, perhaps more so than any other giant out there and there seems to be no end to the variations on their theme, from the smaller trolls in Willow, to the troll race in World of Warcraft, to the larger and monstrous ones in the Troll Hunter movie, to the three-eyed simian trolls of the Elder Scrolls, to these lovable abominations, they're sort of part troll, part gnome. Anyhow, the trolls of D&D are green-skinned, warted things with long limbs, deadly claws, and fangs. Their most notable trait is their regeneration, which recovers 10 hit points at the start of each turn. Unless the troll is damaged by fire or acid, their regeneration continues and the troll is nearly unstoppable. An amusing optional table in the troll entry is how to play out the troll's limbs or even its head after being severed, yet continuing to pursue and attack the adventurers. A final interesting note is the paragraph about troll freaks in the monster manual, which talks about how trolls are sometimes known to mutate due to the effects of their regeneration, either regrowing duplicate body parts or body parts in the wrong positions, or even gaining the traits of other creatures that the troll has devoured. We have made it through the clunky slope of scree and rubble, and I'm glad for it. Take a deep breath, my brave companions, for greater specimens are yet to come. 
Here we reach a rocky ridge, that crossing point between the lowly and the lofty. Prepare yourselves for more interesting entries of giant kind who give us more potency, both of dynamics and ecology. The final ogre on this list barely pulls itself into low C tier. It is a walking siege tower with a defensible parapet strapped to its shoulders and it bears four goblins or other small humanoids which are often firing arrows or bolts while the ogre Hauda goes stomping about, swinging its hefty mace. Once again, it suffers from the simplistic nature of ogre kind, but its style points and living siege engine form help boost it along into a surely memorable combat encounter scene. The Mouth of Grolontor is the first entry from the cycle of advanced giants found in Volo's Guide to Monsters. I have to say that I absolutely love these stronger and more thematic variants of the main six true giants. Even the least of the entries, this strange hill giant, is one that sticks in my mind and it really has character and flavor. As we saw in low D tier, the hill giants are the simplest and most basic of the D&D true giants, and their biggest motivation is eating. Gluttony is the hill giant's ideal, and their stomachs are typically made of cast iron constitution that can withstand even the foulest of scavenged finds. But what happens when a hill giant does fall ill of gastrointestinal sickness? Such a rare occurrence is bewildering. It's a mystifying moment for a hill giant community. They will isolate and bind up the sickened hill giant, and priests of Grolontor, a giant god of hunts, feast, and battle, visit the subject. If the subject remains ill for more than just a day or so, it is seen as a sign from their god, and the subject is kept bound long after he recovers, to the brink of starvation, which for a hill giant induces madness. These mouths of Grolantor are then unleashed, much like frenzied berserkers in battle. They dash and charge about, desperate to tear into any edible foe and devour it. Once the insane giant has gorged itself full, it falls into a slumber and is recaptured by its clan, which will keep it locked away as a sacred vessel of Grolantor to be unleashed another day. In combat, this bizarre giant acts according to a table of four different effects, similar to a confusion spell, which are rolled randomly, and they represent its madness. It has different fist and bite attacks, which it uses in various combinations. This giant will make for an interesting and unique encounter as it flails and frenzies about the battlefield. The fire giant is the most civilized we have come across in this ranking yet. They are lawful evil masters of forge and construction, of war and feudalism. They prefer volcanic environments above all others, but there are some fire giants that dwell in less hot, even colder regions, consuming great amounts of coal and or lumber to keep themselves warm. Fire giants keep to their own customs and laws, and they pass down these traditions through the generations. As much as they are tyrants and slavers, they are also skilled artisans and smiths, and the castles and fortresses they build are sights to behold. I very much wanted the fire giant to be higher on this ranking, as I feel they do deserve it, but like so many others, it falls pathetically short in the mechanics attribute due to, you guessed it, nothing but basic attacks. What a waste. The 4th edition monster manual had two standard fire giants, a soldier and a forge collar. The soldier could make a wide swing with his great sword that hit multiple creatures and marked them. It also had a javelin that slowed targets. The forge collar could evoke pillars of fire as well as bursts of flames that caught the targets on fire. The 3.5 edition fire giant had power attack, great cleave, improved overrun, and improved sunder. In my Scrolls of the Bard newsletter some time back, I designed the Fire Giant Cannoneer, which can fire exploding shots and throw lava bombs, or it can be reskinned to be like the Forge Caller or a Fire Shaman. It's all fine and well to have simple, standard warrior versions of a monster, but please, Wizards of the Coast, at least give us a sidebar of additional options that a DM can add onto these generic stat blocks. 
You did this with the satyr, the vampire, the dragons, and a few others. Once again, the troll rears its ugly head. Or perhaps ugly heads, similar to how Volo's guide gave us some great variants on the true giants, Mordenkainen's tome gave us some great variant trolls. These represent trolls that have mutated in ways that the monster manual only hinted at. The dire troll is one who has devoured other trolls, or perhaps even grafted parts of other trolls onto itself. The result is a hulking, huge-sized troll bigger than any other, with multiple extra limbs and heads. This gives the dire troll higher hit points and stronger attacks, as well as resistance to non-magical attacks, and a whirlwind of claws special ability. It is still a somewhat straightforward monster, but its bits of uniqueness and its freaky factor certainly work in its favor. There's a special place in my DM heart for the Rot Troll, as they were featured in the Swamplands chapter of my Land of Dreams and Nightmares livestream campaign. These are some vicious trolls, let me tell you. Instead of the troll's iconic regeneration, they exude a necrotic aura and deal additional necrotic damage with their attacks, making them incredibly potent damage dealers. The lore behind this monster is somewhat vague in its wording, speaking of trolls infused with large amounts of necrotic energy. This permeates them and I suppose counteracts or supplants their regeneration trait. Though they do heal normally, don't get that wrong, I find them interesting because they're actually not undead, despite this grisly nature they have. Their vivacious bodies are simply too strong to be zombified. This makes me ponder other creatures that might appear undead, but actually are not. The Flesh Golem, the Bone Devil, Lemure, Manes, Dibuk, Sorrow Sworn. It's a peculiar middle ground occupied by few monsters. The Frost Giant Everlasting One brings us back to the series of variant true giants. Whereas the standard Frost Giant is a simple and plain monster, this one is a bit more interesting. The Everlasting One is a Frost Giant who, for whatever reason, devoted himself to Vaprak the Destroyer, who is a lesser god of hunger and strength that strongly resembles a troll. Vaprak is not entirely understood, but he is known as a paranoid deity worshipped by trolls and ogres. When a frost giant gains sufficient favor with Vaprak, he sends a troll to the giant, in secret, who must then manage to eat the entire troll, bones and all. If the giant manages this feat, he is transformed into an everlasting one, gaining a troll's regeneration trait and a rage ability that's quite similar to the Barbarian class. Such everlasting ones are often the mightiest of frost giants and find success as Jarls or chieftains. An additional quirk worth noting is that the everlasting ones sometimes heal incorrectly, especially if they have offended Vaprak, and they end up growing extra limbs or heads. This can be quite taboo amongst frost giant clans, as it exposes the Everlasting One as a worshipper of a troll god. This is a pretty cool monster overall. It's weird, flavorful, and with a couple intriguing story hooks built into it. It would also fit hill giants quite well, which a DM could easily design by reducing the Everlasting One's CR by 2 or 3. Clawing its way into mid C tier is the Venom Troll. In the way that the Rot Troll is infused with necrotic energy, the Venom Troll is infused with poison. It is a dripping, bloated, bulging thing, and any strike it receives causes the toxin to splash out. Its signature move is to slice open parts of its own flesh, damaging itself slightly and causing poison to spray out and showering venom over its foes. All trolls are grotesque and savage things, and the Venom Troll takes this to the next level. The top troll in this ranking, and possibly the most curious troll specimen I've ever seen, is the Spirit Troll. This must be the rarest case ever, as Spirit Trolls are formed when a troll is blasted with psychic energy. Its body regenerates in an insubstantial form, similar to a shadow. It still gnashes and claws as always, but its attacks now strike at foes' minds. 
instead of acid and fire shutting down its regeneration, psychic and force damage do the trick. The ghostly troll's bite in particular is mind-racking, as it's capable of stunning the target. Somewhat like what we saw with the rot troll, the spirit troll reminds us of an undead, but it technically is still alive, it's still categorized as a giant. The more I think about the spirit troll, the more this type of ghost giant really appeals to me. It seems incredibly fitting that the true giants themselves should have ancestral giant spirits, given how primal their societies are and how ancient their histories are that stretch back near to the earliest of ages. Even uglier and more evil than trolls are the Fomorians. They were featured more prominently in 4th edition, with multiple variant entries provided, but they have only a single entry thus far in 5th edition. The Fomorians are a race of fallen Feywild giants. Long, long ago, they were considered the most beautiful of giants, and they also possessed some of the most impressive magic of the fairy plane. Yet their hearts were black. They pursued all manner of wicked ways, the worst of which was an ambitious plot to enslave and steal the magic from other fey inhabitants. Their conquest failed as several Feywild factions banded together, defeating the Fomorians, and these once handsome and gorgeous giants fell under a curse that deformed their bodies into reflections of their twisted hearts. The remaining Fomorians fled into the Underdark, or perhaps the Feydark. They dwell to this day in subterranean strongholds, near underground rivers and mushroom forests. They possess the tremendous strength iconic to all of giant kind, and also an evil eye ability that racks the minds of their targets. Furthermore, they wield the ability to impart their own deforming curse onto their foes, which transforms the subject in horrid ways. The victim can repeat the charisma saving throw at the end of each long rest, so, in theory, he won't be blighted as the Fomorians are, forever mangled by hideousness. The 4th edition Monster Manual has two Fomorian entries, a warrior who deals extra damage to foes subject to the evil eye effect, and a painbringer who wields a flail and channels agony and painful visions into its foes. Monster Manual 2 has five additional Fomorians, the Fomorian Ghost Shaman, Cackler, Totemist, Blinder, and Butcher, each with unique abilities. I have no desire to return to 4th edition, but I cannot deny how cool it was to get a lot of variants on the monsters. Yes, I do create my own variants, and I love customizing monsters, or creating my own from scratch but there are certain creatures in 5th edition that I would like the game designers to provide more than just one basic version of, such as Aarakocra, Bullywug, Troglodyte, Azer, Centaur, Grimlock, and there are others as well. The Etten is not the only creature with multiple heads, there is also the Hydra and the Death Dog, for example, but the Etten is a sentient creature with two separate personalities sharing one body. The heads are often argumentative with one another, making for some interesting acting opportunities for the dungeon master. Even with two brains to share, the Eden is rated as having a six intelligence, which is quite stupid. Combined with the fact that they are typically solitary creatures, this leaves them without culture or craft. Sometimes, however, Ettens are found in the company of orcs, and indeed, legends say that the first Ettens came about when orcs partook in dark rituals to Demigorgon, the demon lord, so-called Prince of the Abyss. These black rites transformed said orcs into large, two-headed things, a rough image of the two-headed Demigorgon himself. Taking us into upper C tier is the fire giant Dreadnought, which adds a little bit of interesting mechanics onto the basic fire giant. This heavily armored soldier monster carries two burning hot, spiked tower shields and can charge down foes like a juggernaut, trampling and singeing them as it goes. What I particularly appreciate about this monster is its high AC and high DC on its shield charge. So many monsters have low armor classes and low DCs for their abilities, so seeing the Dreadnought's high number of 21 for both is so refreshing. 
This monster has a really great aesthetic to it and that nice shield charge attack, but otherwise it is bound by the same limitations of the standard fire giant. At the top of C tier is the stone giant. This is one that I especially like. While the other giants we've seen are vulgar brutes and cruel tyrants, the stone giants are neutral aligned mystics. They dwell within massive cavern complexes, carving, etching, and shaping the stone into a magnificent domain beyond even the capabilities of dwarves, which is saying quite a lot. Sure, the stone giants are still huge creatures, and they have a love of sport and strength, but they are also contemplative dreamers, soothsaying diviners. They consider the outside surface world part of an endless expansive dream, and from time to time they might just take voyage or expeditions there to discover what may be gleaned from that strange world of shifting features bound by the fathomless sky. Mechanics-wise, the stone giant is not too complex, possessing the same basic great club and rock throwing abilities as most other giants. They are also able to catch thrown rocks and boulders, hearkening to scenes from the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, and they also have the stone camouflage trait, allowing them to blend in well with rocky terrain. I myself am a dreamer and an artist and a lover of stones, both natural and carven. In fact, every session I DM, I set out a miniature obelisk made of amethyst as a sort of storyteller's totem. I've also had a character in mind for years, a cavern shaman who dwells amongst stacks and cairns of stones, who plays complex stone drums that create a reverberating and echoing polyrhythm within his own esoteric and primal persuasion. I believe this character will manifest in the third book of the fantasy series I'm currently developing, so the stone giant here truly does have a special place within me. And here we have all the C-tier giants. There were a fair number of them, and they all are worthy monsters in their own respects, if somewhat limited in certain aspects. Often they have low or average at best mechanics, and lore that never seems to quite take us as deep or as fascinating as it could. But we reach now the majestic ridges and ancient crags of the mountains. Clouds drift overhead, rumbling with thunder and flashing with lightning. B tier has but two entries in it, but they are well worth their position above the others. The Storm Giant has the highest ranking in the Ordning of True Giants. They are the largest, the most powerful, the smartest, the most capable all around. Their lifestyle bears some resemblance to the Stone Giants in that they prefer more remote locations and they have an inclination towards divination and prophecy and secrecy. However, instead of forming clans and collectives, they prefer to live solitary lives free as the changing winds, and their chaotic good alignments reflect this. Some humanoids are known to seek out storm giants for their wisdom and guidance, others even worship them like deities. Mechanics-wise, the storm giant has a few different useful abilities. It moves and swims at a fast 50 feet, it attacks with a great sword, rocks, and lightning strikes, and it has a number of innate spells such as Feather Fall, Levitate, Control Weather, and Water Breathing. While the Storm Giant isn't quite amazing enough to make A tier, he certainly outshines many other giants in terms of depth. As I've said before in previous videos, there's nothing inherently wrong with simple monsters. In fact, they are necessary in a way. Not every creature out there can be complex and mystifying, and oftentimes a DM needs to fill out an encounter with more straightforward combatants to accompany the higher complexity ones. But I'm telling you, after going over entry after entry after entry, the simpletons and basic brutes get old really fast. A different take on the storm giant is the quintessent. This rare and intriguing creature is a storm giant who sought immortality, or at least a prolonged existence, and transformed itself into a living, sentient storm. It may still walk about in giant form, or swim, 
or it may fly as a tempest. It must sacrifice its armor, but it invokes lightning to serve as a mighty elemental blade, and it throws javelins of pure wind that deal magical piercing damage and strike targets unerringly up to 600 feet away. The Quintessent is complete with layer actions, regional effects, and legendary actions, though oddly no legendary resistance. Its legendary actions include a gust that moves targets around with gale force, a thunderbolt that deals thunder damage, and an ability to phase out, dispersing into a storm within the immediate area. There is a lot the DM could do with a storm giant quintessent, and it well deserves its high B-tier position. We have ascended to the highest peaks now, my brave companions. We are set to throw open the doors of the spectacular Great Hall, where resounds the legends of the best giants ever known to the D&D world. The Storm Giants may be the highest rank in the Ordning, but the Cloud Giants are the true kings of the Giants. Whereas the Storm Giants are solitary recluses, the Cloud Giants are active and involved. They command scores of other Giants. Fire Giants are their smiths. Frost Giants are their reavers. Hill Giants are their grunts and brutes, and so on. They are richly decked connoisseurs of jewelry and treasures of all kind, dwelling in splendid mountain strongholds, or even the ancient cloud castles. They are noble, cunning, and magical, and only outsized by the storm giants. Cloud giants are also consummate gamblers and jokers. They worship Mimnor, the trickster god of giants, and depending upon which cloud giant you encounter, they might follow either the sinister side or the benevolent side of this roguish deity. Reading the Cloud Giant's lore already sparks ideas in my mind of adventurers getting involved in bets that risk their most precious possessions, or tricks that could lead to side-splitting laughter or nefarious betrayal. Perhaps political intrigues on a scale much bigger than the typical humanoid societies. Whichever direction things go, this is a monster ripe for adventures and storytelling. The abilities of a Cloud Giant, beyond its standard weapon attacks, include a variety of innate spells. Fog Cloud, Feather Fall, Fly, Misty Step, Telekinesis, Control Weather, Gaseous Form, and more. I'm not sure what's with the Cloud Giants having the protruding upper canines, but it seems to stretch back into the early editions. I think their appearance is pretty cool, it's effective enough, but nothing about it is particularly unique or fascinating. If only their aesthetic was a bit more interesting, the Cloud Giant could easily ascend higher within A tier. The Oni is another longtime favorite of mine, even appearing in my original Top 10 D&D Monsters video so many years ago. This creature comes to us from Japanese mythology, a sort of magical ogre demon with various powers and sometimes seen wielding a kanabo, the massive studded clubs. In D&D, the Oni were originally called ogre mages. It is known that the two creatures are related, but the Oni itself is far, far greater than the simplistic and generic regular ogre. During the daytime, an Oni disguises itself as a person, perhaps a traveler or a laborer, which gives it the ability to gather information, to gain the trust of soon-to-be victims, and to essentially weave all manner of plots. It can also change shape into a large giant, such as a standard ogre or a troll. The Oni comes with a number of great abilities, a flying speed, powerful glaive attack, at will darkness and invisibility, charm person, cone of cold, gaseous form, sleep, and a regeneration of 10 hit points per round that has no way of being shut down unless the Oni is knocked to zero hit points. It also has decent saving throws and its weapons deal magical damage. The Oni almost has it all. It can handle all kinds of situations and play out a diverse array of schemes. It makes for an amazing recurring villain, as it is very difficult to slay a flying, regenerating, disappearing monster. 
The Oni is one of those creatures that I wonder why they haven't taken over the entire world. There must certainly be an entire realm somewhere that's dominated by Onis, if not openly, then behind the scenes. This monster has so much potential, and I really hope that the Wizards of the Coast will give us some additional lore and variants. The Stone Giant Dreamwalker is one of the coolest monsters I've ever seen. I already really like the Stone Giant, but this variant from Volo's Guide is a mad wayfarer stone giant who lives on the surface of the world, which they consider to be a dream. Some dreamwalkers leave the stone giant caverns on a spiritual quest, others are actually exiles. They are regarded with a nuanced sense of respect or at least awe. They're mad, yet possess unique knowledge of the strange shifting world of the surface and open air. The dreamwalker has two striking abilities. The first is a charm aura, and the second is a petrifying touch that turns charmed targets to stone, which the Dreamwalker then attaches and partially absorbs into its own body. Such petrified persons cannot be cured unless the Dreamwalker is first slain. This is such a unique monster and well deserving of its place in mid A tier. In high A tier and topping our climb to the heights of giant kind is the cloud giant smiling one. While many cloud giants revere the trickster god Mimnor, the Smiling One embodies this deity, living intensely with his magical and scoundrel ways. They wear masks of split faces, clearly reminiscent of the classical comedy and tragedy masks of theater. And indeed, Dungeons and Dragons itself follows in the lineage of a great theatrical heritage, stretching back as far as humankind itself. From the earliest of ages, we have told stories of mysteries and adventures and heroic feats. They compose such an integral part of the great human drama called life. You are not required to delve deeply into this aspect of D&D if you do not like it. However, if you do desire to play more than just a tactical dice rolling miniature combat game, if you want to taste the thrill of being a character in a mythic fantasy world. You will leave behind the constraints of your mundane routines, at least for a few hours, and let yourself portray a character, immerse into your flair for the dramatic, play a role. The Cloud Giant Smiling One symbolizes all of this and more, as it combines the power of a giant along with the spirit of a bard a trickster, a magician, a poet, a storyteller, all together. What a tremendously spectacular creature this is. Looking at the stat block of the Smiling One, we find everything the base cloud giant possesses. Then building from there is an array of bardic spells from great cantrips like Minor Illusion, Prestidigitation, and Vicious Mockery. Then it has other spells such as Cure Wounds, Hideous Laughter, Invisibility, Suggestion, Tongues, Major Image. It also is a very strong warrior with a sneak attack type additional damage whenever it has advantage. That's right, it can sneak attack you with a boulder. To top it all off, the Smiling One can polymorph itself into any humanoid or beast it has seen before. The possibilities with this monster are nearly endless. This is about as good as it gets right here, and my DM well of inspiration is overflowing with ideas right now just going over this entry. I cannot think of a better choice to receive the crown for the best of the giants. As always, A tier contains some absolutely phenomenal monsters that represent the best of all the various aspects D&D has to offer from combat and skill challenges, to art and personality, to social interaction and dramatic role playing, to stories and the grand call to adventure, to the great amounts of variety and freedom. I have found the giant creature type to be a very satisfying one overall, and I look forward to using more of them in my future games. As an archetype, giants clearly embody power, often on the brutish side of what power can mean. In fact, 
They often express the raw power of the forces of nature in a personified form. They also hearken back to the most ancient of times, when the world was being shaped and battled over by titans, gods, dragons, other forces too big, too overwhelming for early mankind. I do hope that 5th edition continues to give us more giant entries. There are some great ones from prior editions, such as the Death Giant, Eldritch Giant, Mist Giant, Desert Giant, as well as some other worthwhile variants of the Troll, the Crystalline Troll, the Ice Troll, just to name a couple. If you enjoy the content on this channel, again, please like and subscribe. I also run a Patreon page, Esper the Bard, where I release monthly maps and newsletters to enhance your games, so make sure to check that out as well. A big thank you to all my patrons, in particular, Warser, Adam Wood, Dennis Cropper, Vince the Fallen Demon, and Nick the Pirate King. This is Esper, wishing you large encounters and tall tales. May your adventures be many.